Hello everybody. There is a temptress out there and her name is Mercedes. It all began with the 600 SEL and I followed that up with a slew of most unusual and interesting cars from mostly AMG's back catalogue. And today I've got something that is a, a bit of a thug of a car really. It's the SL55. I say thug, it's more like Raffles, the gentleman thug. It's a lovely, nice cruiser that's the exact sort of thing that you want to take on a trip down to Monaco. It's also got a thumping great big 5.4 litre supercharged V8 up front, making sure that you can get down there in time. And perhaps the most interesting thing about this car is that it does actually share a few things with the incredible McLaren Mercedes SLR. In fact, the engine in this is a very, very close relation indeed of the SLR's power plant. Now this only puts out a measly 500 horsepower and 500 pound foot of torque compared to the SLR's over 600 horsepower, but I'm sure this sort of makes do. They do also share at least the same basic five-speed gearbox. Mercedes are an odd company when it comes to their gearboxes, and I think that those boxes are one of the reasons that I've been so reluctant to try and enjoy any Mercs in the past. You see, they never really did six-speed gearboxes. They went straight from five to seven. And although a seven-speed gearbox was available in Mercs around the same vintage as this, it was decided that those couldn't cope with the massive slab of torque. And so this has the more old-fashioned, but also more robust five-speed. And indeed, the SLR has essentially the same unit for the same reasons. Now this was an incredibly expensive car when new. A list price on this was over £100,000. However, the first owner got it at a relatively bargain price. You see, they paid just over 70 for it. So hefty discounts evidently were available. Now, what you probably want to know is how this car performs in a straight line. So now we've got one, let's find out. I've got the car in comfort mode and it's very unwilling to change down. Now, I didn't hit the kick down switch uh, quite deliberately and actually the performance isn't stellar when you are in the lower half of the rev range, but you can feel it starting to pull. So I'll switch into sport mode in a bit and see how it does when I'm changing gears myself. It's not entirely unlike the SL60 that I drove, which was the R129 generation. SL generations appear to last forever. The last one went for about 20 years, and this one went on for a good solid 10, being introduced in 2001 and finally being phased out in about 2011. Now there were a couple of facelifts, but this is the first generation car, and it's one of the last of those two, being a 2006, which is the year of the facelift. And maybe that's a reason for the car's incredible discount. I have actually driven an R230 before, and it was an incredible disappointment. However, that was an SL320, and driving this, it feels decidedly different. One of my main criticisms of the 320 was the fact that the steering, as I recall, was very light, and it may be that my memory is a touch hazy. This was a very long time ago. This car's steering, however, has got a much more appropriate weight to it. You can still tell the power assistance is doing quite a bit because this is not a light car. The McLaren Mercedes might have been the subject of a few jokes because that weighed over 1,700 kilos when its rivals at the time, the Ferrari Enzo and the Carrera GT, were nearly half a ton lighter. But this one's a real heavyweight. This is two tons. And... Um, I really mean that. There's not a lot of rounding going on in that figure either. This is a big old brute. But that's kind of fine. I don't actually mind that anywhere near as much these days as I used to. This thing, as you expect from a luxury car, is absolutely 
dripping with features. It's got sat-nav, it's got built-in phone, and those would have been options when this car was made. You've got heated and air-conditioned seats. You've got massage in your seats. You've got obviously the fully electric hard top. Note the fact that the previous generation had a soft top in it. There's electric motors for everything. So much so that the car actually has two batteries in it. You've got a facilities battery and you've got one that helps the engine start. They really didn't care that much about saving weight in this thing. There's also an active body control in this car which kind of does what it says in the tin and is supposed to stop it rolling. It seems to work quite well. That active body control is one of many things that can break on this car, and indeed it has done in the past. The pump on it failed, which I'm sure is probably not as uncommon as we'd like if you're browsing the classifieds and thinking you're buying one of these. And they are temptingly cheap now. You can pick up a slightly dodgy ropey one for just over 10 grand, although I'd probably recommend buying the most expensive and best kept that you can and paying a little bit more. That being said though, a decent one like this is still going to cost you the good side of about 20 grand and for what you're getting, it's a hell of a lot of car. The view out is rather nice, you've got these little strakes in the front and the car is styled a little bit like the SLR. Now granted, if you actually see an SLR in person, they are quite wild compared to the SLR which is a fairly tame styling exercise, but it's not actually a bad looking thing this car. I mean, the fact that it was only discontinued in 2011 is probably one of the reasons that it actually still looks like a fairly modern design. And I have to hand it to Mercedes, even though this interior is knocking on two decades old, it's a ruddy nice place to be, and so it should be for the money paid. You've got real leather just about everywhere, and the gauges are beautiful to look at. This does feel like a proper car. I can completely get why you would buy one of these. Now, of course, they are going to be a bit thirsty and juicy to run. This one has recorded 20 miles to the gallon as an average on the relaxing journey up to mine, at an average speed of about 41 mile an hour, which for an average speed is quite high. So I would take that 20 to the gallon as maybe a best case scenario. Now one of the things that changed in the facelift was the fact that the car went from having little buttons on the back of the steering wheel to actual paddles to change your own gears. Now the buttons actually work okay and they are very similar to the C55 that I drove the other day. In fact this engine is essentially a supercharged version of that motor. Now that does mean that this is putting a lot more stress on that gearbox and although it is a more robust gearbox than the 7 speed that Mercedes had, it's not impervious to issues and so frequent gearbox oil changes are probably a good idea if you want to keep it in good working order. Now those of you that have watched any of my Mercedes reviews before will know that I have a real axe to grind when it comes to Mercedes' bizarre decision to put all of their stalks on one side of the wheel. This one breaks with that tradition and has one lonely tiny little stalk on the right hand side which appears to do the voice control. Now, if I know anything about early 2000s cars, voice control is um, wishful thinking at best. Now, we're on a slightly more demanding road, so I think it's just about time to put this big old boat into sports mode. So we're now in active body control sport and manual gear shift. Oh, we're currently just bimbling along in third. I mean, it's not lacking for torque load down, but it doesn't throw you into the seat in the way that you'd expect something with 500 pound foot of torque to do so. That is the unfortunate effect of a car that weighs so much. Not exactly keen to shift down either when I ask it, but let's see what she does. Uh, up changes are a little on the slow side as well. This really is a car that's not too happy about you telling it what to do. I would say that the C55 was actually slightly better when rowing your own gears, but it's quite obvious that Merck didn't really intend anybody in this era of car to be changing their own. 
at this kind of pace though even in sport mode the car is extraordinarily comfortable and resists body roll incredibly well uh, the steering is pretty limp and lifeless but to be quite honest i fully expected that does respond nicely though that engine and that is the benefit of having a supercharger rather than a turbo now this of course also was not the top of the sl tree you see you also had the 65 with its totally bonkers v12 yeah overtakes don't happen anywhere near as briskly as you think that they should and it's still a slightly slow car to steer so doing this kind of thing it can be done but when i look down i'm actually going at about 10 or 15 mile an hour slower than you think you are that being said i cannot remember the last time i piloted something down here which had such an incredible combination of flatness and comfort loads of things i've thrown down this road have been uh, pretty good handling cars and ride pretty flatly but they're also quite stiff as a trade-off this thing though seems to be remarkably well controlled when you consider that it's heavier than a nissan gtr and that car has a fairly punishing ride that's pretty remarkable unfortunately what it does do is rob you of quite a bit of feeling so if you are looking at buying a sports car seriously look elsewhere however anybody buying this as a sports car is doing it wrong if that's what you want you should be in the market for a, a boxster or a z4 or perhaps even an slk not that i've driven one of those to really say anything useful about it the truth is that the sl is kind of in a class of its own you see all of the other cars that i can think of that would compare with this are either uh, smaller sportier cheaper cars like the ones just mentioned or they're much bigger cars you things like the Bentley or Rolls-Royce and so on and even something like a BMW 6 series well it's it's not a, a proper convertible sort of sports car like this is it's really one of a kind and you know what it does its job ruddy well I talk frequently about expectations of cars and if you said to me what do I think an SL55 is going to be like I'd say luxurious comfortable very thirsty and also make a nice noise and this does all of those things and if you're looking for something that's going to be perhaps a more dignified way to spend fuel money this is pretty decent in fact i'd nearly even be tempted to leave the exhaust alone because for a standard exhaust it sounds really decent and for a car that is over 10 years old now this particular example is 13 years old this doesn't feel out of date at all that's quite incredible anyway hope you've enjoyed this little look at a very nice mercedes thanks for watching please like comment below hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and we'll see you for the next one bye bye